Welcome everybody. Really excited to be with you all this morning from Los Angeles. Um, wherever you are, whatever time you have, it's really good to be together and think about one of the very uh, enchanting, endearing topic, which is how to be happier in life. Um, so today we are going to focus on happiness, sin number three and habit number three. For those of you who have read Raj's book or have attended his course, you may have recollection of what it is, but uh, let's get into it. So uh, the first, let me see what the sin, say what the sin is. And like Raj said, sin does not mean any moral sin or something you're going to be punished for. It just means that it's detrimental to happiness. And what is that? It is chasing love and connection. So the word chasing is an important one and let me explain. First of all, we all have need for love and connection. And uh, it was really well established by a famous experiment by psychologist uh, Harlow, who many of you may know, he had two wire mesh monkeys in a cage. And one wire mesh monkey was clad in blanket and cozy clothing. And the other wire net monkey was holding a milk bottle. So these were supposed to represent two moms, one with food and the other one with comfort. And then what happened was he let baby monkeys go in the cage one by one to observe what they choose. And many of these big baby monkeys essentially ended up choosing the comfort and the cuddling, which is very, very interesting because we think that food is the most important thing for us and they would go and choose food, but they wanted the love, the cuddling first. And the reason it is significant is not because we don't know it, because we all feel that we all have a longing on some level for love and connection with other human beings, especially with our parents. And many of you know, even after you grow up, you have your own children, you still want your parents' approval. And that gives us a sense of uh, some basic satisfaction. Even when we don't have good relationship with our parents, it's because you are longing for that uh, approval. So why was it significant to actually establish it by using wire monkeys? Because at that time, uh, what is called behavioralism was more prevalent where they thought that um, kids can be molded into whatever, they, whatever uh, the parents wanted by being tough with them. So many of you also may know that the previous generation or maybe whatever generation you belong to, there was this belief of kids to not to be seen, uh, to not to be heard, but to be seen. So kids were treated with her, with not that much praise and hugging. And I remember myself, you know, I don't think my parents really hugged us the way I hug my kids all the time. So in a way, I would say that these kinds of experiments have changed our parenting style. And what we have realized over the years is that the, uh, the bond that we form with parents, and if it is a secure bond, then that in fact helps us in uh, having better relationships in life. And why am I saying that? The sin is chasing love and connection. So on one hand, yes, we all do need love and connection. But on the other hand, being desperate for it, to be extremely needy or anxious and chase it can be detrimental to ha happiness. So I'm not talking about just like, you know, you break up and you go through tremendous amount of unhappiness. I'm not talking about just that. I'm talking about when you have any intimate or close relationship in life, how do you treat it? And you, we know that relationships are the, on the common in common life, okay, not like big traumas or other things that are happening, but in common way of life, relationships is what creates uh, either ex happiness or extreme unhappiness and difficulties for us. So being desperate, as we all know that uh, when somebody is really being needy, then um, we kind of feel like, you know, like maybe that person gets pushed away a little bit. Uh, as a normal, natural reaction that we a lot of times have. 
So what decides this? What decides, you know, how do you get happiness from relationships as opposed to, you know, either getting pushed away or feeling anxiety? So I'm going to talk about one route, one route that you can use to have better relationships. Uh, and as a result, make it into a source of un, uh, source of happiness. So this doesn't mean that you never feel unhappy in relationships or you're never, you know, like doesn't ha- you never have this restless feeling. It's not about that. It's about how quickly uh-huh. you settle into that feeling and how uh-huh. how much you go down, how much you spiral down because of whatever is happening in the relationships. Uh-huh. What is your reaction? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to mute, mute, uh, mute all and then unmute this. me, yeah. Yeah, I've muted that. All right, all right. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Raj. So, um, so basically there is, uh, there are attachment styles that we develop when we are growing up. And attachment styles develop mostly because of our relationship with parents. However, I have to say it's not just parents. It could be uh, a, re- a relationship we develop with a caregiver or maybe with a grandmother or an aunt or somebody who is close to you. So because of these experiences, when you're growing up, you can develop attachment styles and there are pretty much four attachment styles. And I'm going to talk about the three attachment styles that can generate unhappiness in us and then I will pass it on to Raj to talk about the part with, which actually uh, can give us more fulfilling relationship experience. So the three relationship styles that are not so conducive to having good, sustainable, healthy relationships. One is anxious attachment style, which means that think about it. When somebody is, let's say, not available or they don't respond to you, or they don't seem to be, or, or they are there, but then they are gone. They don't seem to be as available. Then what is your reaction? Your meaning, I'm just saying one's reaction. So if that generates anxiety in you and you go after the person, or you want to win that person over, you keep calling that person, or you uh, send them gifts and you know, sort of want their attention in a very anxious style. It makes you feel very anxious. That is anxious attachment style. So kids, when the mother leaves, they feel very anxious and um, they will not settle into, okay, she's gone and she will come back, but they keep uh, crying or showing anxiety. So that is an example of anxious attachment style. The second attachment style that also is not conducive to unhappiness uh, happiness is avoidant. So anxious is when you go after the person, right? You, you feel anxiety. Sometimes that anxiety, the reaction or defense against that anxiety could be avoiding it. Like I don't need the person, totally reject that person. When the mother comes back, not to go and hug the mother, but you know, like totally ignore her and to reflect that into relationships as well. So that is avoidant relationship style. Third one is called disorganized or fearful. What that means is, when someone is available, then you don't value them. Then you can push them away. It's sort of like uh, if this club is giving me membership, then it's not worth being a member of this club kind of a feeling. And when they are not available, then you feel anxious and you go after them. So a mixture of both these anxious and avoidant. So why is this happening? It typically means that there is an insecurity like either I'm not good enough or world is a tough place or people are not good, people are bad. That kind of insecurity that you have, you don't feel safe in relationships. And when I say relationships, I'm including all kinds of close intimate relationships, not just romantic, not just with your spouse or partner, but also with your parents, with your children, with your very close friends, and uh, anybody who is important and anybody who is intimate in your life. I'm including all these different relationships. So these three attachment style, sometimes, and I have to say, I I want to take, again, I don't want to hold parents totally responsible for it because there are a lot of things that happen 
in the childhood, sometimes there may be a traumatic experience. Sometimes you may have a personality trait that may have generated some amount of maybe not good attention, but negative attention. Or sometimes things happen. There may be some abuse or neglect that can happen. And whenever there is a trauma, I'm not good enough becomes a very entrenched kind of a feeling. And if any one of you has experience of that traumatic relationship or traumatic experience, um, my compassion to you, and that is a very, very tough thing to deal with on a regular basis. And if that is happening, then regardless of if it is because of a trauma or because of uh, regular childhood experiences, I just want to say that these attachment styles can be changed. So I'm going to now ask Raj to talk about the happiness part and the most important attachment style, which is the aspirational attachment style. So Raj, over to you. Thank you very much. Somebody else is unmuted there, so I'm going to mute them. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Swati, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I know that a lot of people have joined a little bit late, uh, and uh, if you want to catch what Swati said before you you logged in, don't worry. I'm going to share with you the um, recording of this session, whole session, okay? So uh, what is the uh, antidote to the sin of being desperate for love, desperate for attention, adulation, positive reinforcement from other people, whatever you want to call it? Um, uh, and by the way, you know, uh, underlying uh, all of this is uh, insecurity in relationships. It's, they're all called insecure attachment styles. And I don't know, Swati, uh, I got a little distracted toward the end, responding to some messages, whether you talked about the secure attachment style, which is where you want no, to be. No, in fact, I wanted, I, I said that I'll, I'll let Raj talk about the, talk about the that, one okay. that is aspirational or that the one right. that can generate healthy, happy. Okay, I was going to actually talk about the antidote. Do you want me to also talk about it or just stop with uh, talking about the secure attachment style? I can do that. Uh, can just... Yeah, you can. Why don't you talk about the secure attachment? Yeah, so secure attachment style is kind of the happy medium. You know, you're neither avoidant, so you're not pushing people away if they want to get close, uh, nor are you needy and anxious. So you're not kind of like, you know, always thinking about, uh, okay, how can I get this person's love and why they are not paying as much attention to me as they want them to and so on and so forth. So you're in the happy medium. And you know, as you can imagine, uh, it's very difficult to kind of figure out exactly where that boundary is between being needy versus you know, wanting other people's company, which is very healthy uh, and being avoidant and not being overly kind of, you know, um, uh, sorry, uh, where is the boundary between be being avoidant and um, not uh, being overly reliant on other people and so on. So uh, it, it is a little bit of um, um, art, I would say, rather than a science, figuring this out. But uh, I think Swati had sent you guys uh, who had registered uh, this uh, ECR scale, emotions in uh, close relationship scale. And hopefully you filled it out. And I see that some of you, at least one of you has actually kind of uh, in the chat box uh, said that uh, you're avoidant. Uh, and Adriana, thank you very much for sharing that. That's very uh, courageous of you to do it because a lot of people are, you know, uh, somewhat embarrassed to share this, but we are a very uh, supportive community. So go ahead and please share whatever it is that you, uh, the type that you might be, if you, if you feel comfortable to do that, okay? So the, you know, secure attachment style is a kind of a happy medium between the two, okay? Uh, and, you know, I, I can't really elaborate much more on it than that. Um, and uh, essentially, the secure attachment style is manifested in behaviors that are healthy, that other people find healthy. You know, if uh, somebody breaks up with you, uh, of course, you, you feel sad, but you're not depressed for, you know, three, four months, right? Uh, if somebody wants to, uh, su your support, you don't push them away. You actually are compassionate towards them and so on. Okay, so with that, I'll turn it back to Swati now. Yeah, so Raj, the secure attachment kind of reminds me of the Goldilocks story, exactly. where she goes to the to the bear house and there are all these soup bowls. One is too hot, the other one is too cold, the other one, and the third one is just right. And I also want to say that, uh, you know, like you said, it's an art and not a science. So secure attachment does not mean you never are unhappy in a relationship scene because things happen in relationships. It, but what secure attachment does it, it kind of tells you 
uh, how quickly you settle into it, how you interpret it and what your reaction is. And you probably would have this feeling yourself, like uh, even when something goes wrong in the relationship, how much control you feel or how you feel about yourself and the other person. Uh, so that probably can be a way to know if it is a secure attachment. And we all know that when relationships work, they can really give us a great sense of connection. We are all social human beings. And, um, by the way, before I just, uh, resume, uh, hello, hello, Elena. I didn't see you before. I see you now. <laughs> Hi. I'm sure hello. you're keeping track of. Yeah, I'm sure you're keeping track of what people are saying, uh, and we will we will get into the question and answer afterwards. Um, yeah. So secure attachment style. So as I said. Uh, this is like one way to derive the happiness from relationships. But um, Raj, so the what's the habit, the happiness habit that that uh, you would say as an antidote to this insecure attachment style, or even when you have a secure attachment style, how do you get? I guess one of the things. Okay, so before I uh, hand it over to you. I, I do want to say that there are methods in which you can, in fact, uh, develop secure attachment style. And if there is a trauma, sometimes it takes time. It may take specific therapy, trauma-based therapy. Um, but even otherwise, there are certain, certain traits you can cultivate. And those traits, in fact, will help you to go more towards safety and security in relationships. So um, Raj, why don't you talk about the, uh, the antidote and then I want to show a, a slide after you're done talking about it. So let me unmute myself. Um, there are several things that you can do if you're feeling insecure in uh, relationships. And uh, like Swati said, you know, often, um, these uh, insecure attachment styles uh, are because of our childhood experiences. Uh, she didn't kind of you know elaborate on that, but uh, so it might be out of your control. So stop being harsh on yourself that you're excessively needy and uh, stop feeling you know low on self-esteem and so on. If that is your situation, often it is out of your control. Okay, so that's one thing to remember. Um, and I'm going to talk very quickly about two things that are somewhat tactical that you can do in the moment in order to feel good in relationships. And one of those is to revisit memories uh, of uh, positive, healthy um, uh, relationships in your life. And it could be from your childhood. It could be from uh, somebody that is you know, not really part of your family. Maybe it's a coworker with whom you have that kind of a relationship. Maybe it's a teacher right, or a mentor or something like that that with, with whom you feel that you get the right kind of uh, reciprocity in relationships. So you may not be getting it with the people who are very important in your life, maybe your spouse or maybe your child, somebody like that, but uh, you're getting it from another source and that's okay. All right. So just kind of uh, remind yourself of those relationships and you can do it uh, indirectly as well, not by calling them directly, but by thinking in your own mind of interactions with them or looking up past photographs or videos and things like that. The second thing um, that you can do is to um, uh, express gratitude uh, for things that are going well in your life. And a kind of a mirror image or other side of the same coin is uh, to be self-compassionate to yourself. And so, you know, remind yourself of all the ways in which things are going well for you. Remind yourself of uh, all the ways in which the problems you're having are similar to problems that other people might be having. So you're not unusual and so on. So Remind yourself that uh, your life is, 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 you know, if not good, at least okay. Okay, so let me talk about the antidote, which I elaborate uh, in the book quite a lot. And uh, this is an antidote that is going to take a little bit of practice. Okay, it's not one of those things that you hear about it and you say, oh yeah, maybe it'll work, um, you know, but never try it. And then if you never try it, it's never going to work, obviously. Okay, so the antidote is to actually transcend the feeling of neediness that you have into actually being um, kind and service oriented to other people. Okay, so you're going to, you're going to have to dig deep in order to practice this antidote because you're feeling spurned, you're feeling that you don't have the love and connection and attention that you need. And here I am asking you to rise above that feeling and be nice to other people. 
it's um, like when you're feeling depressed, um, you don't want to go out of the ho home, right? I mean, you want to just mope, um, you want to wallow in self-pity, maybe, you know, take a bath. Um, but you know, deep inside of you, that the best thing that uh, you could do is to go out and hang out with friends, as if your life were okay, is to go out and see that funny movie, as if life were okay, right? So it's the same analogy here, that you're going to have to rise, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, even if it uh, is very difficult to do, and exhibit the characteristics of somebody who is secure. Somebody who's secure would uh, be kind to other people, would be compassionate to other people, uh, would uh, uh, you know, um, respond to other people's pains in ways um, that exhibit that kindness and compassion. And so that is the idea, is to exhibit the features or the characteristics of somebody who's securely attached. And uh, by, even if it seems like you're faking it, you will eventually make it. You will eventually become more secure in your attachment style. Okay, and here very quickly, I want to add a couple of rules that you want to follow in being kind to other people. So one rule is make it fun for yourself as much as you can. So give in a way that uh, isn't you know just purely kind of an act of a do-gooder, but also is fun for you. So for example, if you love um, animals, right? And I do, I, I love especially dogs, then go and volunteer at a animal shelter, right? Uh, if you love children, then maybe, uh, you know, volunteer for the Big Brother, Big Sister organization. If you like getting your hands dirty and building things and doing physical things, then join Habitat for Humanity and so on. So make it fun for yourself, okay? So that's number one. Second is that you want to see the impact of your giving. I know it sounds a little bit egotistical, perhaps, you know, uh, in our mind's eye, you know, the poster child of somebody who's the um, epitome of a a good person is somebody who does a good deed and walks away, okay? Um, but uh, what I'm suggesting here is that if you do something good, then stick around until you see the positive ripple effects of that act of goodness. And, you know, be thankful when other people are thankful to you that you had the opportunity to be this agent of positive change. So don't just walk away. So for example, if you go and uh, volunteer at the animal shelter and uh, these dogs are really, really happy with you and the animal shelter people, um, you know, want to give you a gift, receive it uh, gracefully. Uh, if you go and volunteer at the big brother, big sister, if uh, the children are really, really happy and they bake you a small cake and they want to celebrate um, with their peers, um, all the acts of kindness that you've done, then take that in and so on. So see the, um, uh, this is import important because when you see that positive impact that you're having, it just motivates you to continue on. Uh, otherwise, you might kind of burn out a little bit. So it's very important to see that what you're doing is actually having an effect, a positive effect on other people. Okay, so with that, I will stop and turn it over. So, uh, yeah, so Raj, I'm actually going to ha ask everybody to go through a little exercise before talking more about the really important points that you just made. Uh, but before I... Um, re-emphasize or restructure what you just said. Let me ask everybody to go through this exercise, okay? So are you guys ready with a, either a pen or pen and paper or if you are not distracted by having your phone or whatever it is, I'm gonna give you a scenario and I'm gonna honestly think about what would be your reaction, okay? Um, honestly, so this is something, if you wanna share, great. If you don't wanna share, it is for yourself. So as I said, you know, going through happiness, going towards happiness, that road is not always itself extremely happy. So it also requires some amount of honest self-examination, which is not always pleasant, but just know it's okay because it is actually going to make you stronger and as a result, more fulfilled. Okay, so this is a, this is a friend of yours. Just imagine a friend of yours uh, who you have done a couple of favors, and basically you have been nice to this person. And now this person, you uh, either during the pandemic or whatever it is, you kind of, you know, got in touch with them. Uh, maybe, you know, try to call or text them, but their response wasn't as warm. Their response was lukewarm or maybe sometimes not even responding right away. And, uh, you are um, noticing this. 
And my question to you, first question to you is, um, what are your, what are going to be your thoughts when this situation happens? What are your thoughts? Honestly speaking. And Maybe you they're... like, you, uh, you like this person. And now suddenly they are not as available. You like this person. Uh, Ma'am, this is the first time I'm talking. Hello. I think whatever you want to say, uh, can I ask you guys to basically put it in chat? Uh, because you all are going to be muted. So I'm kind of reading everybody's reactions when they are typing. Okay. Yeah, all kinds of, yeah. Yes. So I'm getting a lot of different reactions. Now my next question is what's going to be your action? What will you do about it? So I understand what your thoughts and feelings are. Now, what will you do about it, if at all? Wow. Lots of reactions, actions. It's so many that I'm having a hard time <laughs> reading all of them, but I'm going to go slow. Okay. All right. So let me summarize uh, kind of what I have seen. So some of you will blame themselves. Like I, do, I deserve it or I'm not good enough. I'm just some, uh, some of it I'm paraphrasing, but I see these reactions. Some, some of you will um, feel a hole in themselves. The insecurities will be triggered, right? And some of them will blame the friend. Some of them will say, you know, what an ungrateful friend or uh, that, you know, you, they'll think about the things, the other things that they have done, the friend has done, which will confirm they're blaming the other person. Some people may even have concerns about what happened, like, did, is she okay or is he okay, um, health or anything else that may be going on in that person's life. So that is the other reaction. Uh, some of them, okay, so now, now um, so these are the three types, right? Blaming our, oneself, blaming the other person, or sometimes wondering about the circumstances. All right, so now what is the action? So I said that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying that, I'm seeing that uh, some people will just, you know, leave them alone, will not want to talk to them. Some people may have some feelings of revenge, like how do I teach a lesson to this ungrateful friend? What would be the best way to teach them a lesson? Some of you will have um, maybe a traumatic reaction, a trigger reaction, and will cry or will wonder about, you know, like uh, what is it that is wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And not just, taking responsibility, but blaming, and as a result, spiraling down. That can happen. Uh, some people are saying that they will want to communicate with the person and ask them, what did you do? Uh, what did I do? Or what's happening with you? And so on and so forth. Um, okay, so these are different kinds of actions. So now, as you can see, it would depend on what is your general pattern. You know, there will be some pattern and some of it is anxious. Some of you may call that person, you know, like try to get in touch with that person desperately. Some of you will just push that person away. Some of you may feel anger, that anger and pushing the person away is a sign of, as I said before, avoidant relationship, uh, avoidant attachment style. 
and the ones that will work hopefully is more or less maybe communicating with the person if you are secure then you would uh, thank you raj so if if you have a sense of security or safety or even without that some of you may want to communicate and find out what exactly happened so as you can see if you are if you have a secure attachment style then you would neither blame yourself nor that other person vehemently all these reactions are by the way possible in the beginning but then it depends on how much you attach to these negative unhappy generating feelings and how do you take care of yourself and at the same time the other person so one way could be to in fact communicate with the person and then find out did i do something or are you okay and when you ask the person did i do something that's a tricky thing because that will you will have to be open to what the other person is saying hearing what the other person is saying and what if the other person blames you for the things that uh you think are unfair are you willing to listen to that you may then defend yourself or accept what they are saying but communicating with the person with open mind would typically work if it is a relationship that's important to you by the way when you think that well i don't need the person i'm independent i don't need anybody although on one hand yes emotional independence is an important trait to have because uh, relying on other person for your own happiness may or may not work as much however it shouldn't if it's coming from a sense of insecurity and as a defense as like creating uh, armor around us then it can make us lonely that's the thing about relationship problems it can make us feel lonely when it is coming from an insecure attachment style so what about this secure attachment says i'm going to show you this uh, slide okay and this is an important point and again as i said this is one way one route to having better relationships you may have your own other routes but think about it be open to this idea so relationships which is what we want to create to have good secure healthy relationship as a source of happiness for that one way is to feel secure and safe so what are the traits that you can cultivate in order to have a secure attachment style and good relationships so gratitude some of them raj you have already said and i'm just actually summarizing what you have already said and adding a couple of other things gratitude forgiving in a relationship because people make mistakes you make mistakes so forgiving not just the other person but forgiving yourself if you think that there is something you shouldn't have done for your own imperfections compassion compassion is when you see the other person in pain if instead of judgments if you find love is arising in you and a sincere wish that the other person's pain be reduced that's compassion love and a wish that the pain be reduced non judgment <coughs> because <coughs> sorry <coughs> a lot of times when somebody like some people had a feeling of revenge or some people was wondering about what's wrong with that other person we have a lot of judgments sometimes those judgments may be against ourselves too so practicing or cultivating non judgments and then the other part is giving which is something that raj did mention which is service to others and he mentioned creative ways or fun ways of thinking about how can you be useful to others and a lot of times that can generate a very basic sense of happiness in us and altruism is a lot of times it's kind of an innate trait and it makes sense because we want to all be safe in a group and giving and taking both are part of that okay so now all these are great
things to cultivate. And again, it takes time and effort. One way to cultivate these is to do meditations that are around these traits. Another way is you can um, consciously think about how can I practice these kinds of things, contemplate, but practice, practice, practice. That is the key. Okay, but this is a very, very important point. Underneath all these things that you do want to cultivate, there needs to be a sense of good sense of self or self-worth. And one way to go to this sense of self-worth is self-compassion. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. What happens if you don't have it? Some of you may feel like you are being a doormat. You are forgiving the other person or you are always the one who's giving. So even giving, if it is indiscriminate, always giving, it will make you feel, maybe you may develop resentment or you may expect things back in reciprocation. You may not get it. You may feel frustrated. You may experience anger. So you may feel that you, know, you are not treated right. You may not have a good sense of, practicing gratitude, forgiving, compassion, non-judgment, and giving, unless you are giving all these things to yourself. So self-compassion is about giving all these things, not just to the other person, but to yourself too. To treat yourself with kindness and respect and to uh, have empathy for yourself. And when you have some pain arising in you, what if you feel love for yourself, that I understand you, I get you, you are, I'm one person who are always with you, let's say you are talking to yourself, I'm one person who knows what you go through really well, I get what you are going through, and to wish yourself well, so that is self-compassion, self-compassion is something, again, you can cultivate, you can practice it, and uh, some of you may have gone through my uh, eight week long self-compassion class that I teach, which is based on a standard curriculum that's developed by the Center for Self-Compassion. Self-compassion has become a big field these days. And in fact, uh, the person who did research, lots of research on self-compassion, she is um, Raj, your co colleague, as in not in the same department, but uh, Kristen Neff, who is in UT Austin. Um, and Chris Germer, who is a practitioner, and Chris Germer and Kristen Neff have developed a whole eight week long program where the teachers get trained. And uh, you, uh, when I offer it next time, you all, I will send you a uh, notice. So I hope you consider this. So self-compassion has three parts. The first one is, first of all, you have to be mindful. You have to be aware that, okay, I'm having these difficulties and to allow yourself to experience it, not to run away from the difficulties. So be mindful. And then the second part is understand it's common humanity. Understand you are not the only one who experiences this. Many other people, when they try to practice these things, they do experience some difficulty. So it's not so unusual. And this is life. So let's say the friend who did not respond back to you, and let's say you were having difficulty with that, then first of all, to experience that difficulty, to be aware of it, to, to know what's going on with you, and then to understand this is life, it happens. I don't have to either get sucked into self-blame or other blame, but this is life. First of all, to go through these difficulties and relationship problems, it's life. And that's such a big, actually, that can be a big relief to know that this is life. And then the third part is to wish yourself well, to, to tell yourself, I understand what you're going through and let me calm down, let me be kind to myself. And then I will think about what would be the best way to go about it, depending upon my personality, my how much I push myself, what kind of courage I have and so on and so forth. So the action, com action part comes later, but self-compassion allows you to have a soft landing and also to get into self-worth. So blaming yourself, criticizing yourself, that for that self-compassion can be an antidote. 
at the same time some people have a habit of blaming everybody else or the the rest of the world that somebody else did something wrong and that's why i'm suffering and if that is happening that doesn't help you either because you have no control over that not just that that it may not be based on reality so how do you look at yourself not self blame but you want to replace it with taking responsibility so there is a difference between self blame and taking responsibility think about what could i do differently in a calm way and for that also self compassion is useful because it's uh, about understanding yourself and being okay with whatever is coming to be kind so it helps you also to understand i'm blaming everybody else but maybe there is something i may have done and to pay attention to that without spiraling down it's not always pleasant so now i'm going to stop sharing and before we get into question and answer and elena i'm sure there are so many i, I you have a big job today of parsing through all this and coming up with uh, the uh, the ones that cover everybody's concerns but before that i am going to ask you to uh, do a small meditation with me so i uh, so uh, again like raj said you know it's one thing to just understand these things intellectually but you have to allow them to sit there be okay with it and allow them to go deeper to your heart level so i'm going to do a self compassion meditation with you self compassion is such an important trait it's not about being selfish it's not about self pity self pity is when you look at somebody or yourself oh poor me or poor them that's pity but compassion is this is life but let me understand yeah i know this is really difficult for you this is so hard that is compassion and i'll tell you based on my own experience the self compassion practice has improved my relationship with other people with my family and with my friends because i take responsibility sometimes not in front of them sometimes in my own mind <laughs> however i mean we all have some amount of ego and again we all have a lot of things coming up to us sometimes hatred revenge uh, disappointment frustration anger all these things are possible all these feelings are normal and that's such an important point not to blame yourself or think about yourself or oh, i'm being such a bad person i have all these feelings no that is not the point when you have these feelings to look at them yeah that's what i'm feeling right now to be mindful of it and then send kindness to yourself it doesn't mean you have to actually act upon each and every feeling that comes to you okay so let's see the self compassion so i'm going to ask you invite you all to close your eyes to go within yourself everything else is outside this door and if you haven't already please make sure you are muted and uh, maybe raj can mute everybody okay let's go so relaxing your shoulders and making yourself comfortable wherever you are make yourself bodily physically comfortable and taking a few deep breaths and as we take the breath noticing the nourishment that comes to us through the breath the energy and the nourishment that can come through the breath notice that
and now think about a conflict in a relationship you are think you are experience you have experienced in the past allow yourself to think about that conflict and if it is a huge trigger for you it if it is a very traumatic experience i would advise not to use that right now but allow yourself to think about any conflict and if you are not able to think about it just think about the example i gave you of a friend who did not respond back to you in with the warmth that you were expecting just think about that situation and allow yourself to feel the feelings that are coming to you when you think about this relationship conflict what are the feelings that are coming to you allow yourself to experience these feelings again hopefully it is not a big trigger and if you find yourself being triggered you can let go but if it is okay to bear these uncomfortable feelings at the moment then i'm inviting you to experience them and can you name them label them like what are these feelings if you look at them what is it is it sadness frustration anger whatever it is restlessness insecurity if you can just name these feelings one word maybe more than one feeling maybe two three is it possible to look at it allow yourself to feel it and then name these feelings be aware and mindful of these feelings hmm that's what i'm feeling and this is really difficult it's unpleasant and it's difficult this you may want to place your hand on your heart area this is really hard to think about it to feel it i'm feeling whatever the feelings you are experiencing and this is really difficult how does your body feel when you are experiencing these unpleasant feelings does it feel tense or any pressure just notice the body and yeah this is difficult for me and now let's move on to the next part which is to understand the common humanity whatever i'm experiencing these feelings it's part of life feeling uncomfortableness or unpleasant feelings difficulties in relationships it's part of life i am not the only one there are others who have experienced it or you may even know other friends who have gone through something similar i am not alone and this is part of life even if there is a feeling of loneliness that is triggered 
to know that even that is part of life. It's a dance, life is a dance between sometimes feeling lonely and sometimes feel, feeling connected. If you are feeling maybe misunderstood by this person, even that, no matter what it is, it's part of life, it happens. And maybe then, if your hand is already on the heart area, to maybe move a little bit to give yourself a soothing experience. And the third thing you want to do, third phase, is to have compassion for yourself. And a compassion, again, as I said, empathy, love, and then wishing well. So let's see if you can allow yourself to go deep, deep within yourself to your guts and see if you can understand your feelings. Can you understand yourself? Yeah, I understand you. I know this is really difficult. I know exactly what you're feeling. Can you say that to yourself? I know you and I know you have a reason to feel this way. Allowing yourself to go deep, look at your guts and see if you can empathize with your unpleasantness. You know yourself. You know how bad it feels and you know the reasons. I'm doing my best. Now wishing yourself well that may you find a way to deal with this. May you find your resources. I know what you're going through. I know exactly what you are experiencing. And I hope it gets less. And I hope you know what to do, how to take care of yourself. I send you love and kindness. I send you a wish that you find a way to take care of yourself. May you find your own resources. And maybe you want to soothe your body, relax your body, get in touch with the body. It is such an important thing because when you relax the body, it is about self-care. If you think there is any part of the body you're holding it tense when you're experiencing this unpleasantness, allow your body to relax. Take a few deep breaths to allow your body to get the nourishment. That you are okay at the moment, I understand you. I'm sending you love and I'm sending you 
best wishes that you can find a way to take care of yourself. Relax the tummy, relax the shoulders. If the heartbeat or the breathing is fast, then just gently allow yourself to slow down. Turn eyes inwards, looking at yourself that you're okay. And breathing in, taking a few deep breaths again. Just relax, just relax your body and relax your mind if it is possible. Give yourself time. May I give myself time to think about how to deal with this? unless you already know. And experiencing the deep breaths a couple of times and getting ready to leave this self-compassion meditation. You can open your eyes. And just imagine this becomes a habitual thing for you. Whenever there is any difficulty in life, today we are talking about relationship difficulties with a lot of things that come up in life. This becomes your habitual pattern to handle things. And for some of you, it may have just seemed like words. They may not have meant the deep, real compassion towards yourself, but that's okay. When you keep practicing it, then your heart opens and the words actually fall into your heart, like the rabbi said. So all these meditations we are doing, if you keep doing it, then it makes a big difference. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to Elena to ask us questions. Very difficult, very difficult task of covering what people's concerns are. All right, so I, I, I think maybe we can um, put together a question from Jennifer. And also Maggie was expressing similar concern about um, when self-compassion uh, can turn into uh, selfishness, and yeah. uh, Jennifer says that there's uh, there's something in the, in the West where now it's all about you, and so yeah, what's, yeah, what's, how to find balance between this two? Yeah, yeah. Now that's a great question. Yeah, it is. A, a, a lot of times people just say, "Oh, I need to take care of myself," and then uh, do not really show compassion to others. No, that's a great question. Self-compassion 
uh it's a very interesting thing like i said uh, again and again we have said that it's about putting the oxygen mask on yourself before putting it on the baby so it is not it's about balancing self care with other care because just like it's about you 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 a lot of times you also get a lot of messages don't be selfish think about others do things for others and yes that's a great message but there is a balance so it is balancing self care and other care so it's really interesting when you are practicing self compassion see it's about compassion as you understand yourself and your own difficulties in a deep way you also understand other people's difficulties in a deeper way and practicing compassion becomes easier or a habit when you also pay attention to what difficulties you are going through have you experienced when we go through anything difficult in life a lot of times as difficult as it is it in fact makes us compassionate towards others difficulties that's the way to know what others are going through so self compassion is in fact in some sense, some sense opposite of selfishness it is a concern that a lot of times people do express and the western uh, individualism yeah it has especially nowadays you know is all about you so anything that goes extreme again can create unhappiness because you also you need friendships you need people so to know what to do when the discernment is is what is important elena or raj if anybody has anything to say about this but otherwise the next question one thing that i want to share with everyone mm -hmm. is that you know a lot of these questions um you guys are all smart you have a lot of experience you have a lot of ups and downs so if you're still struggling with these questions obviously there is not going to be an easy answer to these questions and uh, so you know a lot of the answers uh at least you know to me uh in a sense come when i give it time and i'm mindful of what i'm going through at an emotional level rather than being desperate to come up with an answer and know with clarity how i react to a situation so you know i i call this roasting uh you know when you take a marshmallow and put it on a fire you know so that it it becomes nice and brown and ready to eat Uh, and you got to be comfortable with being you know in that situation of roasting in life and not just with relationships with other things you know wanting a successful outcome and you're working hard towards it and it's not coming wanting to sleep and not getting to sleep in many situations just being comfortable with the discomfort uh, if you get to that point of understanding that it's okay to be comfortable with the discomfort rather than being impatient to come up with an outcome um a lot of times you'll get insights into it and mindfulness is a very very big part of self compassion mm -hmm. you know even to differentiate between self pity and self compassion i don't think there's any one kind of you know magical yardstick you can use you know it inside of you which one it is and if you're self aware then you'll know when you're kind of crossing the boundary from self compassion into self pity and being overly indulgent on yourself and a lot of that has to do with this idea of roasting and being Uh, open to yourself what was going on right now and paying full attention with as much self awareness so that's why the mindfulness practice is so 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 important yeah. and if you can talk again and again for you know till the cows come home about all this but you need to become practiced and rooted in mindfulness and self awareness and that's a great great point that everything takes practice and it's not always pleasant to practice so yeah so mindfulness in fact is a training in how to stay with uncomfortable feelings and discern them and then get to a so so first thing i do want to say uh, in, on practical level those of you who want to actually get more into these things on practice is first of all is the key right so you can take a class like you took raj's class of happiness but you also want to take a practice oriented class and this particular program uh is hoping to give you the practice but this is just 1 hour and 15 minutes so in between sessions you may want to practice these meditations and if you uh one i i mean you can either go on my youtube channel to meditate or you can check self compassion websites and there are many ways in which you can 
do guided meditations. Another thing is you may want to take a actual class or program or you may want to go to a therapist. And some of you may have stigma towards therapy, but I have to tell you, it can really be a life-changing experience if on a regular basis, you're keeping track of what's coming up in your mind and how to make sense of it. So make this into your priority again, as uh, happiness habit number one says. Elena, next question. There's still many questions that I want to ask. But I don't know how we're going to manage Okay. Um, there is a, well, that is one that came from Vidya. And he's asking, uh, you know, what if uh, you feel okay, you kind of uh, fix it, you're okay, and then the person does the same thing once again, and then you feel uh, bad again. And so what, what can you do about this? If I can yeah. give a little comment about this, what, what I think is that it's not something that you can fix, you should fix temporarily. I, what, I, what, what I like to imagine in this case, and it's not my idea, probably you heard about this, um, it's just imagining that you are a garden of flowers and you should be not chasing butterflies, but not, like taking care of your garden. So if you grow your flowers, you water them, you nurture them, you enjoy this garden, it looks beautiful, it will attract all the butterflies in the world. And the best butterflies will come to you. And you should not worry if those butterflies are not coming or because, you know, they will come when they, when they enjoy this garden. And so I think that's the answer. And, and if you feel comfortable with yourself or like the vessel that is full, uh, can you know give liquid to another vessel, not an empty one? So I, I believe that 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 could be the answer to feeling good, um, not temporarily, but more or less regularly on a permanent basis. So yeah, Elena, you're making a good point. You're saying basically develop a secure attachment style, not just about this one person, but overall. And that's what you mean by uh, tending to your own garden to have that safe and secure. And then you will know what to do. Like, uh, is it about like, how do you attract butterflies? So by tending your own garden, when you have a secure feeling, then you will know whether you want to communicate with the person or decide that, okay, it's not worth spending my energy. It will require some courage in, in uh, thinking about what you want to do overall. Yeah. Um, I also, um, we have a few questions coming. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we had questions from um, Roshin and they're from, um, so um, Rushil was saying that, uh, was asking about whether attachment style can depend on gender of, uh, of, of kids. And I wanna also add the question about um, a culture. Maybe that can also depend on the culture mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of the family in which you grow. Um, Nate uh, said that Indian parents did not hug him much. And also, um, uh, Buzenas, uh, he put attention, big, bold uh, type, big, big capital letters here. And he said that, uh, how, what, what can he do? Because he depends on his parents' decision so much because his parents uh, have non-Western culture and, and all the things have to be approved. Um, by by the parents, like what kind of college mm -hmm. you go to, who you marry to, and if, mm -hmm. if the if he doesn't agree, then he feels like the parents won't love him, and he feels needy. Uh, and he yeah. doesn't know how to get rid of this. And so, yeah. could you comment on this? I know it has like several parts: cultural, yeah, gender. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you can give some comment. Right, 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 right. So, um, I'll say something and then I think Raj, I have a feeling that you have things to say about this. But yeah, attachment style, like the, see everything you're talking about, gender, culture and all, the, this is about environment, right? The environment you, you grow in. And attachment style is about building a relationship with parent or caregiver or someone like that. And it also depends on the environment. So all these things will make a difference depending upon where you are and how you experience it. Yeah, so it will, but okay, so what is secure attachment? Uh, first of all, somebody's asking, I just want to, again, one more time, want to say what is secure attachment? It is about when something goes wrong in a relationship and you, in the beginning, you'll feel whatever you do, whatever your initial reactions, unpleasantness or whatever, but you settle into it 
and you don't feel you don't get into the game of either self blame or other blame but think about okay you don't you feel safe you know that you are likable or that you can work on it eventually or you make a choice okay i don't need it in my life or yeah i will try to see what i did and what i could do differently or communicate and so on so it's a safe feeling about you know who you are not get sucked into the insecurities because of uh, not having the relationship going the way you think you want again all these things in the beginning the first instant reaction is one but how you respond to it and what you learn that is what will decide the secure attachment style and what you said elena the last part about parents that's a really tricky thing i have to say that that's a very hard thing when you don't feel approved by your parents because of whatever cultural like differences that some cultures you know parents want to dictate things all throughout and if you don't want that then they may not have uh, the relationship that the loving relationship that you want first of all understand parents have their own baggage too so parents themselves have their own attachment styles and a lot of time based on that that gets transmitted to the child and there is something about you know growing out of the parents nest and leaving the nest so this is this is a tricky thing but it is possible to think about the separation from the parents to be my own person and then to forgive yourself for the imperfections you have in your parents eyes then you can forgive your parents in the end but first forgiving yourself for not following your parents rules and having needs that are different than your parents that is life so uh, you're right swati i do have something to add to this as i have to anything anybody ever says <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh yeah I don't know if you've noticed this you probably have uh, but it's certainly something that uh I'm I'm very aware of um the problem is less important than my headspace okay what i mean is that a problem can seem very very challenging and insurmountable and overwhelming but if i'm in a good headspace then i think i can solve it and the reverse is true too it might actually be a trivial problem and i just make a mountain out of it because i'm not in a good headspace it's maybe i'm hungover maybe i'm sleep deprived maybe i've had uh, you know emotional turmoil because of an argument with somebody and so on so a uh, lot of things you know responses that i'm hearing and elena's garden analogy is beautiful and it kind of you know refers to the same point which is that if you're in a good headspace then everything is solvable and so the idea is to get to that good headspace somehow okay and i i you were searching for it on google but i couldn't find this image but you know there's this image where it says i have a problem what do i do a b c and then the last option is not d but love okay and and if you choose love if you choose love then almost anything is solvable it is difficult to get to that point often um because we are human we are emotional right and we have baggages we have conditionings but to recognize that is the first step and that really gets us gets us back to habit number 1 you know how can i prioritize happiness how can i prioritize love how can i exist in a state of love so that i come up with creative solutions to all all kinds of problems and, and with parents you know i don't know what age uh, the persons uh, you know who asked the question was but i really love this quote by jk rowling uh, the author of the harry potter series and she made this comment in a harvard speech she she said there's an expiry date for blaming your parents for your screw ups there's an expiry date for blaming your parents for your screw up you're only 24 so maybe you know you're not quite at that expiry date but certainly by the time your age 50 plus right uh, you're well past that expiry date and so you know they are coming at life with their own set of baggages they don't have bringing and so on and so forth and uh, you know so just forgive them in a in the best way possible right not in a patronizing way looking down on them just understanding way understand where they're coming from and why they did what they did and move on um so those are a couple yeah. of comments right and i i also find it i mean i have said it so many times sorry for the repetition but this has to the foundation has to be to forgive yourself 
and to understand yourself because otherwise without and when you uh, raj when you said to you know have that uh, sense of self or something i mean that is so important uh, yeah to have the right head space that's what you said so that is about secure attachment that is about self compassion that is about forgiving yourself because otherwise it's really hard to the idea of forgiving anybody because your parents you have to forgive for not pleasing them or whatever wants you had there could be shame and these things some of these things are tricky you real i really um uh, ask you to go and seek therapy without having to have any stigma about it or take some kind of a program or contemplate but it's totally. all possible totally agree with you swati and raj and i was thinking that uh, even uh, when raj said being a giver helps a lot uh, helping pe- people and sharing love it's it, it it's something that you can you know when you give something it makes you feel that you have it can even be you know this way maybe you feel like you don't have but if you start giving then it it feels like you can fake it but at the end it, it can become real that you have it if you share and if you give and i don't know if you have we have time for the last one uh, if i can quickly ask this one we have a question <laughs> okay. um from uh, santosh he said that uh, when recollecting the past he could see that he have expressed all three types of uh, attachment styles in his relationships and i had a question can it be can it happen that we have have a different style when we are interacting with different people because they have their own style <laughs> so maybe with yeah. one person i feel needy with another one i feel avoidant and with another one i feel secure attachment maybe it's also yeah. about finding the right combination of styles and then you can fix yeah. and you know become secure if you find you know like the good the right partner for yeah, you yeah 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 so that's a that's a common question can we have different attachment styles with different people and uh, as we are going through many relationships that can happen but there is a basic pattern that when we have in the beginning like there's an autopilot reaction that comes up and that is the attachment style but attachment style is also changing based on your experiences in life so given that let's say one person is making you feel very secure you may feel secure with that person and you may feel oh i have secure attachment style but it's not about like one person the general common ground that you have in any close relationship that kicks in uh, yeah and so if you have all different attachment styles think about if it is attachment style or reactions that you develop to different people based on who they are yeah relationship is about two people not just one but whenever there is a conflict what's the first reaction you have first thing and that is what the attachment style will is will will mean but it changes it changes over time i can tell you by my own experience i i have uh, become more and more secure i think in the beginning when i was much younger i probably had more fearful attachment style you know like if somebody is too needy push them away if somebody is uh, showing a lot of interest then ah that's not so good and at the same time um yeah so yeah so becoming secure in your relationship is entirely possible and i really find self compassion is a uh, is a really good route all right folks i think we should um, stop now because we are uh, well past the uh, deadline uh, 11:15 and i don't know elena has other stuff uh, coming up in her life thank you very much for attending the session as always uh, thank you swati so much for uh, the session and thank you elena for being such a great moderator and of course thank you thank you. thank you raj elena and everybody for being here uh sending love and compassion to you all and hoping you can experience the same for yourself bye <laughs>